into it if you are. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, Diamond Discourse, do you, is that how I should refer to you? Um, uh, Diamond's just fine. I Diamond's just now fine. My, my video was like out of focus for a second. Yeah, I just saw that. It just, All this smart moment. technology is, is <laughs> not cooperating today. But, it's uh, really dumb smart technology. <laughs> yeah, I go by I go by Diamond. Um, just that's my last name. So oh, the really? channel. Oh. <laughs> uh, there's a great tradition, you know, of alliteration in the SE community. <laughs> there is. That's true. I, I've broken uh, that massively. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, that's true. All right. Um, so diamond. Yeah. So, um, wow. We've, we've definitely had some really interesting conversations before now, like, uh, I, uh, although not nearly enough and, uh, you're, you're a chap that's always interesting to talk to. Um, so what I do in this, uh, little show, little episode, little video is just basically find out about people's journeys into the street mm. epistemology community, um, and their relationship with sort of, I guess, uh, se adjacent ideas um you know any any sort of religious histories or like spiritual histories or mm-hmm. flat earth histories or any, anything like that that kind of stuff so you right. know what 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 was your what was your genesis to the se community what was your entry point yeah i mean i knew this question was coming of course <laughs> because i'm a fan of your channel um thank you but but i realized that you know my memory is terrible <laughs> and, and <laughs> And so, like, I have a story about how I think I came about it, and I'm not really certain, like, if you SE'd me on it, <laughs> maybe it's a false I memory. would have low confidence <laughs> in, in the truth of my my claims. So, um, you know, so th- take that with a grain of salt. But, <laughs> but if it's, you know, there's not a lot of stake in getting it wrong. So uh, I'll tell you the story. If you hadn't that said all this, we'd have just believed you. That's it. <laughs> Well, I mean, so, I mean, all of this is about like getting at the truth. Like we, a lot of us value truth. Um, And so that's one of the things that has been really nice about doing this is it it gets me to question things and, uh, and yeah, maybe I I question things too much and then you get paralyzed with doubt or something. (laughs) I I know it's opening up a, a tangent too soon, but yeah, I've been exploring the idea of like how honest human beings can be at all mm-hmm. like you know every language and memory and and context you know present like all kinds of different ways of interfering with like what we might consider raw honesty right. um like i don't you, uh, there seems to be this feeling that in order to be not to be honest you have to be dishonest which i think is maybe not entirely true like maybe there's a way of like you can certainly be insufficiently honest or you could be misleading uh, all, all those kinds of things um but in any case i think those things aren't just always willful i think they are you know for, like you say you know fra- frailties of misremembering how things happen yes. all that kind of stuff you that's know, right it's, it's in- like it's like your your present truth Right. <laughs> right, your present, tr- which moment. is a dangerous, which is a dangerous <laughs> waters to start swimming in as a street right. epistemologist. But That's it's, right. so, but I think it's an important thing to reflect on for sure. So, so what is this false and, and largely fictitious and sure, entirely? Sure, yeah. So the story, <laughs> the story I would tell uh, would be that uh, <laughs> you know that I've watched Anthony Magnabosco videos, um, and, and at some point I noticed he mentioned the SE Discord at oh, the end right. of it and and maybe for some reason i paid attention um and came across the the discord and um and then found out about the the practice sessions that happen usually on saturdays uh and and this is the more recent history of just in the past uh maybe two years or so uh of attending practice events um with dolly who's just phenomenal mind and i love listening to uh you know and so there's a, there's his, a man who has the right voice for his microphone i'd say <laughs> right 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 yeah aside from just the the, the logic and uh and the discussion which is also all the there yes absolutely yeah, yeah. No, no, so, dolly's lovely <laughs> um so then just going to those and then once i you know realize that you know this is this whole community doing this really remarkable pursuit of making better conversations and Mm. and listening to people and uh you know there's some question and i I appreciate some of the criticisms that have come into se but 
when you contrast it with what the alternatives are, right, it feels well advanced, you know, in in, yeah. in the the results. So um Yes, yeah, so not beyond also, not beyond criticism, but certainly that's the, right. The, the, the currently least worst of the, <laughs> or at least yeah, aspiring yeah, it, to be. A... <laughs> you know, it has links with uh, democracy in that sense, right? It's, right, uh, exactly. Yeah, the worst, uh, the, the the least worst system, or the worst right. system, other except for all the rest. Yeah. Um, so, but if I might uh, suggest, the uh, Anthony's videos largely would have come up in your feed. I would have thought as recommendations because you're a certain sort of type of person already, right? Presumably. Yeah, like, good, yeah. Good I mean, YouTube. I certainly enjoyed listening to uh, like the atheist experience. Um, mm. I have a scientific training. Um, I'm, I come from a Catholic background uh, okay. originally, but I, um, and as I was growing up, you know, it's funny because it's, I had a lot of interesting beliefs because I, I always enjoyed science, and I would listen to Art Bell. I don't know if you've ever heard of Art Bell. He's rings a, a bell. Wait, oh wait, I did. I honestly didn't mean that. <laughs> yeah, I actually didn't mean that. Oh wow, you've gone all blurry. You back? <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, no, yes, no. The the name rings a bell, but I couldn't place it. It's uh. So he was a AM talk radio host uh in the United States, and he oh. would do all sorts of like conspiracy theory stuff, like Area Fifty One. Um, okay. You know the reverse ghost stories, reverse audio stuff. And, and he had this call in radio show. Um, and, and it would, went from like 10 at night to like 3 AM. And I would listen to this as like a 10 year old and just that be sounds fascinated. Awesome. Right. <laughs> it is so good. Um, and, and so that there was occasionally like well-respected scientists on there too. Um, huh. So he did have physicists on there occasionally, and and you know that kind of maybe helped get me into it. Uh, so I went on to do a PhD in physics, um, and and so that interest in I guess the paranormal, if you like, um, you know, stayed with me, but but faded away right as I started learning about some of the critical thinking um, approaches and and really wanting to know is it actually true right and and so many times we come across things that are stranger than we can imagine and, that's, exactly and that's right. so it, exciting um so it, it, this yeah. is this is something i wish more people embraced was this idea that you know the the, the you know we if you want magic there's magic there you know we right. call it science but like god damn like right. know, <laughs> there, there's some pretty amazing stuff sure. out there and like the universe, like look at, you know, I spoke to uh, Sushi uh, in, a, in an interview and at the end of that, you know, we were talking about looking yeah. through the, you know. At the about the sky. Orion Nebula, I heard that one. Yeah. Just beautiful, yeah. you know, and like Absolutely. physics and, you know, it, it's it, the only reason it's not called magic is because we think it's a it's weirdly academic and we understand it, you know, but right. by all, to all intents and purposes, it, it's still magic to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just, I, here's, here's a great example, magnets. Just right. <laughs> uh, like honestly, just it's such a dumb thing, but like, yeah, why is that not magic? That's magic. Right. It's an invisible force field around this little lump of metal, and we have a. Really and you don't even have to go that exotic. You can just look at gravity, right? <laughs> Gravity's amazing. Just, like, just pulling with. <laughs> I feign no hypothesis. It is. Uh, it is. It is amazing, and 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 yet, you know, parochial because we're we're sort of weirdly used to this stuff. We don't think mm -hmm. of it as magic, and I think one of the things that's nice about science is embracing seeing the ordinary as extraordinary again almost because you start to realize that why is that happening like why why like apples have been falling from trees long before newton pointed out that they needed to do it and right. um and nobody would really thought too much about it and then what what a beautiful branch of physics you know or, or you know came about and mathematics came about as a result of newton saying why is that yeah <laughs> um and, or at least I guess in peeling case, back more, the layers yeah it was more how can i measure it it wasn't so much how it happened as as like mm -hmm. how can i describe it but in any case it was still you know absolutely you know, revolutionary and this was one of the things i just talking about my physics mm. uh, exploration one of the things i learned in doing physics i i always wanted to get kind of like to the edge of knowledge almost and see what that's like you know and um what you learn is that well first of all 
we don't get nearly trained as much as I wish we had in in like formal critical thinking and where the science, the philosophy of science, where it comes from. Like Karl Popper, I didn't even like come across until you know just well mm. after my degree, um, and 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 you never get at the like why right it's it's a descriptive science for sure it's not like you learn quantum mechanics you can calculate things but but you don't get that answer that satisfies you maybe of saying well how, you know how does this work right <laughs> we get these models and um so you know in some sense it can be a little un unsatisfying even uh, after all that and and who you know maybe that's where religion has one up on science that they have this explanation they can, right they can leap to the end of the book and say ah oh, this is who did it you know right like, yeah we right. figured it out there, wow there we have maybe an that's satisfying for you if you like yeah so yeah i mean in many ways science can be deeply unsatisfying in that way it never mm -hmm. finds truths it just finds be better models and um right. i also think if you're at the coal face so much of like in your particular field because any 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 one scientist is not there's no there's no a scientist right it's like millions and millions of different you know scientists all researching mm -hmm. different very small things you know essentially and, and incrementally moving their little domain forward right. by you know small increments essentially it's very rare that you get these sort of epoch shift leaps of you know holy shit we've just you know changed everything yeah um and but but at the same time i think you know that that can, i think that can certainly feel then that you're not making any progress or the endeavor of science is not making any progress but mm -hmm. it, it is this sort of expansion isn't it this sort of inflation thing where all of the walls are moving simultaneously outwards and you, we're sort of science is ever growing in this kind of steady and relentless way <laughs> yeah i i think about the you know have i lived through one of these momentous things and i guess i haven't really i was a little too young to appreciate the discovery of the inflationary universe mm. and the uh the fact that our universe is accelerating um it's not it's not just expanding it's mm. speeding up right and that's dark energy mystery so you know for me it's it's been that status that i've learned about and and you know at some point we'll get to the next phase. And I just hope I live long enough to see that. <laughs> well, we've had, we've had quite a few Higgs boson and the gravitational waves, for example. I mean, there, there have been some pretty interesting, but they've all been sort of confirmations of existing theories. So this not is maybe it. as this... sexy. <laughs> but, but we've just, yeah. we've just, we we've want just to put... find something that breaks physics. <laughs> we've, we've just shoved, uh, we've just shoved James Webb all the way up there. And um, yeah, you know, hopefully, yeah, hopefully absolutely. we'll be getting some pictures of some weird shit. Like, cause that's the thing. That's the, you know, this is the beautiful thing about science is like they're most most excited about finding something they have no idea what the fuck it is. That's that's the raw like. Well, people are going to get careers off the back of these exactly. discoveries. So, and then right now we're at the point where the theory is ahead of the experiment in the right. sense that the theorists, you know, they got stuff so well done, and so the experimentalists are like really trying to to find that chink in the armor to yeah to it's expose a, expose the next layer of the onion right we're, we're right, at that yeah. layer and we really just have to peel it back somehow so yeah i find it remarkable when people are talking about quantum theory and and like the the effortless woo that comes out from something like quantum theory because it's so <laughs> insufficiently well understood and the models are so weirdly you know broadly right. descriptive but not really you know essentially asserting magic um you know it, it, even in the actual models i mean literally you know quantum teleportation with with you know is is, is just basically saying and and yeah so it could be in a bunch of places but these aren't necessarily connected which is <laughs> um you know that's weird and and you know there's a lot of people that feel a certain way about that and and some people get really excited about it and other people are like well you yeah, know this is because this is where the ultimate mystery lies and and therein lies the end of science uh, abil mm -hmm. science's ability to push forward and it's like that's a very dangerous thing to assert like every time we've thought we've come to a limit you know yeah. say, saying that this is as far as science can go that's a hostage to fortune i don't think i'd ever want to <laughs> i'd ever want to and that's when that's... you get to ask them so how do you know that <laughs> right exactly yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's been it's been proclaimed many times throughout history that sort of every there is a, everything that's going to be discovered has pretty much been discovered already it's all pretty much done you know it's, it's yeah. a 
stunningly unimaginative uh, pronouncement, but one that seems <laughs> to keep coming up and seems to be coming up again recently. Um, right. Just uh, just because it's you know, a curiosity, you you mentioned you sort of grew up Catholic and and mm. then listened to a bunch of ghost stories. How, how how was that growing up process? Do you still consider yourself a Catholic, or do you, do you no you know, no I wouldn't carrying atheist scumbag like the rest of us? Uh, yeah 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 <laughs> yeah. You can you can label me that if you like. I'm, I'm not too. <laughs> bothered by it but um yeah the i think i was probably a teenager when i i told my parents that i wasn't you know i didn't want to go to church mm. um not just because it was you know a little bit boring but <laughs> because i you know really didn't believe the stuff they were saying mm. um so that that didn't go over great they they kept thinking that i would you know come back at some point um, but they're also of the bent of a very liberal Catholics that are okay, you know, as long as you're a good person, that sort of thing, then then you're all right. All right. I, I, I'm grateful that I haven't had the experience of some people that have really been shunned um, or anything like that. So... Um, so it was yeah. a gradual release then as opposed to a sort it of was, epiphany moment. Um, yeah, I don't have a big deconversion story or anything mm. like that. It was just like as my education progressed in my in my field it felt like it fell away and didn't feel like it fit um now having said that there are st certainly still uh people who are religious in in physics as well mm. um and you know i haven't had as many conversations as i would like with some of those people and how they square the circle reconcile those <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah um so it's not something that I was able to do in my head, but but that's not to say that I'm I'm far from uh, consistent. You know, I'm mm. sure I'm hypocritical in many many ways, and, right. and that kind of uh, humility is also something I've come to appreciate in in street epistemology. Is the you know I could be wrong, right? I always have to remember that and. Um, and sincerely yeah. believe it right <laughs> that, i don't know how i yeah. don't know how ingrained in street epistemology is it certainly yeah i think i think a willingness to accept firstly that you could be believing the bad thing like you know right. if, if if you do think that you know that you're that the other person holds a stupid view you have to recognize that worse situation and circumstance isn't different you would be on the other end of the conversation like, mm -hmm. you have to recognize it's not a fault in the particular human that you're talking to but just that situation and circumstance leads you to conclusions that sometimes aren't always helpful or true um but then the other thing of course is that you know anybody that claims certainty and i say this to the point where it's become tiresome but anybody that claims certainty must be wrong you know how, how where, where do you get the certainty from like where, what are you talking yeah. about like clearly that seems philosophically dishonest to me and and so i i can't i know i can't be certain about anything and you're and certain that would about that I, I well this is the, this is the argument but of course they know is the answer because <laughs> where, where would i stand to be that confident about the fact that i right. could not be confident so maybe maybe there is a place i could stand about which i'm certain yeah. but i don't know it um so no i i'm, right. I'm not even certain about that <laughs> yeah, yeah. i'm right <laughs> which, there with you. Which, which seems tricky and i get people feel like that's evasive but honestly i think it, but i think it's really important because like Anybody, for example, that says there definitely is no God is making a claim I could not make. Definitely. There's no way sure. I could make that claim. How could you possibly do so? Um, so that's interesting. So so you, you never felt specifically like you were letting go of your religion, I guess. So it just sort of fell away from you gradually. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about sort of the Carl Sagan uh, non-overlapping magisteria sort of framing of science versus religion? Do you feel like that these are meaningful magisteria that don't overlap or do you feel that they are more i'm uh, interested in what is in that magisteria mm. that i might be missing right <laughs> so so if they're not overlapping what what is there that i need to know and that is true about the universe that i see, could learn yeah that that the, the, the is true part I've never, I've, always, I've, I, I slightly would want to suggest that it's not overlapping because one, and this, this is uncharitable, but what one is a domain where we discover what is, and another is a domain whereby we hope for what we might want to be true. You know, like mm. those are no, no, non-overlapping precisely on the basis of the fact that one correlates to 
truth and reality, whereas the other correlates with aspiration and desire, you know, and, and, and that's not, those, those are non-overlapping because the, the, the latter has no need to conform to anything, right? It has no need to, to justify itself or be connected to anything or be, you know, so that's, any of these things. That sounds like you're taking like the position that the, uh, the spiritual realm would be a realm of hope that is not descriptive of, of the universe necessarily, but I would challenge you to think if you were in the frame that you believe this is a spiritual magisteria, that it, it was real, right? Well, how does that then look? How does the universe look in that sense? So then there would be these almost parallel worlds, right? Um, yeah, the, 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 this is exactly my my. Un, perhaps uncharitable definition of why he thought it was not overlapping is that exactly that you know it doesn't it doesn't have to ha it doesn't have to be justified there doesn't have to be it, there's no rules about it that need to conform to anything other than the assertions of individuals essentially mm. um so you know I, I i and i think that because of this i think that that's perhaps why you may find there are physicists who believe not not even me i mean i know there are physicists and scientists of every category out there that, that believe in god and i think that for a lot of them i think they don't even try to square the circle because they consider them to be mm. two different things entirely like that they're, they're not in the same frame of reference you know and i think that there's a there's a weird sort of implicit there's, there's a, 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 a weird implication there that sort of suggests well if science is really exploring what is and and it's not overlapping magisterially with this other thing then isn't that an acknowledgement that this other thing actually isn't <laughs> um in some way I've, I've i've often wanted to explore that idea with people yeah too. i feel like i feel like we need that third person to come so we can yeah talk to, to make that claim <laughs> exactly. that would be great <laughs> but i yeah. find it fascinating because especially as somebody who's you know i mean look you know, it's, it's it sounds like science has been you know, the gradual easing into science is, is correlated with the gradual easing out of a, of a religious worldview. And it's interesting to notice that that doesn't happen to everybody, I think, mm -hmm. um, yeah. for sure. So, so within, within SC, so, so, you know, atheist experience, how did you yeah. get to the atheist experience videos then? Because, because, you know, it does not necessarily follow, I guess, that science leads to atheism per se, as we just described. So what was it, what was, do you think was triggering your Google searches? I don't know. <laughs> I That's don't know enough. how I came across that. Honestly, <laughs> um, I've been, I've been listening to it for a long time, and perhaps it is because of my family that it, you know does still practice, and uh, you know I, I'm still so close to it that I'm like, you know how 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 are they thinking about this, <laughs> and yeah. and so then that that show did kind of explore that and and i didn't i i wouldn't say that i necessarily had a good understanding of why i didn't believe um like i couldn't like reason it out i couldn't verbally explain myself very well or, or i would be doomed against an apologist um but i, I think doubt that, that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but I think that I'm I'm always very impressed when when I do come across people that can coherently explain things so well. So mm. um that I can follow the logic so cleanly and, and when it clicks, it's like you you can almost you know, you get a, a much better you know, it when, you know, you know it when you hear it, don't you? And, and a little all bit, of a sudden, yeah. you, they, they're, they're sort of describing your thoughts out loud in real time and, and doing right. a better job of it than you know you would have done. And and you're like, yeah, that's what I would have said if I could have thought to put it that right. way. That's exactly right. what I mean to say. Yeah, that's so interesting. It's I wonder. A joy to see that there are brains out there that can that can do that. Um, and and I yeah, I don't really consider myself one of these people, but this is this is one of I think a, a long effort of getting there is you know trying to train my brain and my speech to cooperate so that when i am talking to other people that i can communicate my ideas right. clearly and understand them and then and so this 
you know, this all does tie back to SE. And, and it's funny too, because the other day I was uh, looking at some slides for uh, the astronomy course I teach. And, uh, and th these slides were from a couple of years ago, I was updating them and I found one that was like, so close to SE of talking about how we went from a, uh, a heliocentric worldview to a geocentric worldview. And I asked the students to think about what that would be like, you know, write down something that you feel strongly about and what would change your mind, right? <laughs> How would your mind go from this mm. idea to, the, to completely the opposite, right? And it's not that you have to actually do that because maybe you're right. But can you find a criteria to change your mind? And if you can't, why not? Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, it's it's all very tied together. That's, it no, that's like. great. Um, yeah, one of the problems with science is that most people don't do it and uh, don't practice it. Aren't scientists, and therefore they're in a. I think they're made to feel uncomfortable because oftentimes the things that they believe about science or the things that they remember science has claimed or, you know, um, are essentially arguments from authority. I mean, they're not in the sense that those scientists will publish papers and go to great lengths for make, to make it not just an argument from authority. But I think for most people who feel excluded from the the, the ability to engage with those papers because the you know the sheer volume of data and information and language use and you know yeah. just the the back the necessary background to understand it um it essentially makes it impenetrable and therefore for most people science is an argument from authority and mm -hmm. and it, and you know look that's a problem, but it's not a solvable problem. I don't think like at the end of the day, specialized skills and, and skill sets are going to be required to push bound these ever more sophisticated and nuanced boundaries of science. And therefore the, you know, the, the non argument from authority form of their scientific proclamations is going to be less right. and less intuitable by most people. And this is a real problem because like even scientists, like, you know, one, 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 a scientist on another end of a different sort type of science is going to have very little of the necessary toolkit to understand maybe a, a scientist in a different field in a different area. Yeah. And um, you got to be very wary of scientists who are talking outside their field as right. to <laughs> how much it, uh, do well, through they, their field. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and and it also reminds me of the approach that some of the people who believe flat Earth sincerely, right? Exactly. Um, you know, if you hear some of their discussions, they they are fighting back against this argument from authority, and so yeah. I, I really appreciate that about when people are trying to do the science themselves and they're trying to come up with experiments to test their hypotheses yeah. and everything, and they're like, "Don't just take a." people's word for it you know the spirit is is there i agree um, yeah i really do so, agree with that yeah, yeah. like and, and and i you know the, the, i mean the problem is that their experiments tend to either be wrong or come to the conclusion that the world isn't flat and and that annoys them and then they go and do more experiments but you know look for some of them you know you can't you you can pity the endeavor to have the conclusion that they're looking for um pre you know uh, up front i mean that that's just bad science every which way right but mm. i mean to be fair like most scientists would would fall into the, the category of like really okay so if we conducted this experiment but it would be really good if this <laughs> this was the answer um but but then intellectually honest enough to say no it wasn't the answer <laughs> so um you know some of those some of the flat earthers definitely have been in that space um and, it, and it's really interesting to watch but yeah like it's difficult you know it's difficult because science is complex you know there, then there's no yeah the, you know, the, the more dumbed down it gets or the more simplified it gets, the less accurate it gets. And therefore you get like people describing quantum theory in, in these kind of weird fuzzy ways. And then people start getting all wooish about it. And, and then the ability for the average layperson to tell the difference between a, a statement that is pure Deepak Chopra and, mm -hmm. and a quantum physicist actually talking about quantum physics. <laughs> they they're, might sound they're, similar. Yeah. They're going to yeah. sound very similar. Um, and and yeah, it's it's a real problem, and I I don't know how we solve this. And mm -hmm. I guess education is is definitely part of it. Um, and and I, and I guess basically building trust in establishments may be another part of it. But in any case, um, from from an SE perspective, you see so what what made you, what what helped you um, make the jump to to starting a channel and actually getting getting your feet wet as it were and jumping yeah. in because that's a big jump, right? I mean, from just being ambiently 
kind of liking the community and the people and the conversations, but then like deciding to take it to the street, as it were. Right. Um, right. <laughs> what was yeah, that like? Well, well, and of course, uh, watching Reed's channels were really inspiring too. And, and I think seeing some of these people interact on the SE Discord and having them be so accessible um, made it feel like these are just normal people that are just doing something that they're passionate about. And, um, you know, I want more of this in the world. Mm. <laughs> um, so it was kind of like, I didn't feel especially well qualified and I still don't feel especially well qualified. And, um, but I want more of it in the world. And if my, you know, average channel inspires someone else or below average channel inspires other people to say, Hey, if this, this guy can do it. I can, I can do it. Right. Um, that's, that's where I'm at. It's, it's uh, very true. Yeah. We were talking, I think we talked a few months ago about, but cause we, we did, we did the sort of SE review and then we did the, the clubhouse thing. And I think we, were, mm -hmm. we chatted about it briefly. And I was talking about the idea that, you know, of imposter syndrome basically being in full <laughs> effect, like the whole time, like why for sure. Gonna, what yeah. is going on with this? Um, yeah, I mean, fortunately, I'm not a perfectionist either. So I'm okay with being, you know, mediocre at stuff. You know, I'll put out videos that I'm like, oh, okay, the sound's not great, but. <laughs> and that's I, the right way to be. Oh, Christ. I, 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 yeah, I have very much the wrong. I have the very much the opposite. I, I, I just won't, unless it's like, oh, good, like, um, I try. Right. I recognize I need to, but I put too much effort into things that aren't important when I produce yeah. these things. Well, but that's we just. Need, we need all, all kinds, I think. For sure. Um, <laughs> but but so. getting it out there is the most important thing you can do. Yeah. Um, yeah, perfect. and I think that when I was on the the Discord and and just doing weekly practice, um, it was very beneficial. But I I also recognize that it is different from actually talking to strangers, and and I wanted to get that experience yeah. and see what that was like, and and you know it it definitely can hook you in um, in terms of like people who are willing to open up and talk about deep ideas um, about any topic. And I really do like the movement of SE away from just religious topics because there's so much potential there. Um, and, and so that's been a real joy. And, and I guess a bit of a pandemic hobby really, because I did start during the pandemic um, mm. as things were, were starting to get back to normal. That's when I first went out uh, to try and talk to people because uh, my other hobbies of like roller derby, um, they were still oh, shut same. down. Um, oh yeah, Lund you, shout you're out to like Lund a girls. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow, awesome. Yeah, I, I, it's been a long time since. I, wow, that's such a weird hobby to have in, in common with somebody. <laughs> um, awesome. Yeah. No, I was a, I was like a, a trainee zebra for quite a while for a, like a, the Cambridge Roller, the the Romsey Town Roller Billies, which I don't think they're. A, I don't know if they're still a thing anymore, but like that See, was quite some time. That's ago. that's hilarious. I yeah, I got WFTDA certified level two. Nice. I, I've been to a <laughs> oh, few shit. tournaments, so yeah, it was. <laughs> that's awesome. Good times, and, and I'm hoping it it restarts. But yeah, there's something about the uh when you're on skates and like analyzing the action that's happening and trying to apply the rules it's like it's like trying to like juggle and brush your teeth and, and do like a hundred things all at once simultaneously 100 percent, yeah and and applying that logic it, it that, that's a joy and and there's so much similarity in conversations when you're trying to think and talk at the same time and reflect and you know, there's a lot there, but we should do that us on roller skates. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, possibly. No, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe it'll add something. You know, I, if I <laughs> maybe maybe it'll be harder to be. I'd like to test that. What, as a as a dyslexic person, um, right. I I <laughs> I um my my automotive processes, my mental automatic processes, are not very well developed, and so I have manually i manually do in my head a lot of what people do naturally automatically right. and and so one of the brilliant tests for somebody with dyslexia this is going to connect by the way to what you just one of the yeah. brilliant tests for somebody with dyslexia is to ask them to stand on one foot and and get their balance and then ask them maths questions or, or questions that require <laughs> uh -huh. them to think a bit and you'll see them like wobbling and falling over because huh. 
what what's what's going on there is that the the balancing stuff that normally most people do with an entirely separate part of their brain they sort of offset it to this kind of more automated part of their brain isn't being done so i'm manually i mean i'm not really conscious of it per se but i'm manually processing my inner ear fluids i'm i'm, I'm watching the sight mm. light level i'm i'm actually controlling my balance thinking very much about the pressures on my foot and things and i'm doing all of this in in, in a cognitive way that's more analogous to cognitive thought essentially as in you know the same thought process is used to solve math problems which means if i take energy away or attention away from doing that actively to mm. answer a complex question my i can't do both and so i start to fall over so i would wonder whether or not that if you were roller skating whilst doing se would your interlocutor be less able to be dishonest and evasive <laughs> because <laughs> i suspect that it takes more, more mental, energy yeah. to lie yeah to construct an, a, an artificial narrative than to re just respond honestly so maybe that's some maybe i've never this. heard of this as is this a property of dyslexia in general that you're yes yeah interesting wow. it is is the principal component of dyslexia which which is that you know it's it's why handwriting is so awful in dyslexics because and, mm -hmm. and again this is weird for me because i never realized that other people well, when i was younger i didn't realize people did it any other way but i draw the letters right which sounds stupid because you think well when i write everybody draws the letters but you don't really draw the letters most people are what i gather is they they think the word and their muscle memory and their hand you know, not mm. even just muscle memory, but they did the coordination, the structure of the word just is a consequence of that, you know, like it's a consequence of invoking the mental model of what you're trying to write. Your, your hand just knows what to do. And right. there's no thought whatsoever in going to, into it. But if you think I'm actually manually drawing every letter every time without, without reference to a, some kind of automatic components in my brain, yeah. that's why dyslexics have such terrible handwriting. Because we're literally focusing on drawing the, the words, each the letters one and, and constructing the words effortfully one letter at a time. And I recall learning and being excited to find out that you are also an A fan, right? Yeah, what is, I'm starting to <laughs> suspect that this is not nearly as uncommon as people claim it to be because like it's supposed mm -hmm. to be extraordinarily uncommon. So either there's a high percentage of people I seem to meet that seems to yeah. also have this which would be interesting if there was a correlated uh, condition here, but, 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 or it's more common than people think it is. I, I've is heard about 2%. Possible. Is that? For... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which, which definitely doesn't correlate with my experience because it seems to be something like 25%. <laughs> like it's well, like so one I, every I, I am definitely not, uh, I do not have aphantasia. But, oh, okay. Uh, um, but I know oh, I two people that do. Okay. And, and so I've had lots of conversations about that and, and it, it is wild to me how different different minds work and and so this when you talk about drawing the letters as a dyslexic oh, yeah, yeah. you don't even have a, a mental model of that letter so like, i wonder I, if it's currently it would be interesting if it was correlated with with dyslexia in some way yeah. actually i would love to find out i mean it's just a wild thing like i i find it really like i understand how people that don't have this condition will look at me and think well how the hell all of these things i, I kind of get that but for me it feels like you guys must be like hallucinating all the time <laughs> like i can't imagine what that's like like to conjure mental images that evocatively like so quickly right. like and the the stories people have told me about their experiences with this just blow my like the idea that they can look at an empty table and, and imagine a a, a a cup on the table and it's kind of there visually in front of them and mm -hmm. i'm like that's hallucination that's not okay like how do you <laughs> well it, and even weird. having the concept of hallucination would be weird to you i would think like i, I don't think i've ever well i don't recall ever having hallucinated like I, I don't i don't know if i could necessarily tell the difference but yeah. oh my gosh now i want to yeah i want to put <laughs> you on off my of drugs <laughs> yeah that's, that's what everybody wants to do whenever they say yeah. fantasia is they want to pump me full of lsd and see what happens but yeah, yeah. it's it's yeah, I, one of the things I quite like about this is that, at uh, uh, the very least, it, it's a con it's something that seems to be very different about me than most people, and it's something that's interestingly went unnoticed until relatively recently, mm -hmm. right? So this is a big difference in theory between my experience of the world and other people's experience of the world, and and I think it's really telling that we can be that mentally divergent, like without ever knowing, 
right? Yes. And I think that's almost certainly true for a wide range of things we don't yet have labels for. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I sort of make this claim oftentimes that people are very aware of physical differences, but totally disregard the possibility of different mental differences, right? And I don't mm. mean just like atypical mental behavior or atypical neurology, but more just like it would be incredibly unlikely that, you know, in, in, in the thought experiment that we were able to sort of put a, you know, in, in the science fiction stories, you, you put the mind cap on one person, put the mind cap on the other, and somehow mm -hmm. you're able to swap bodies and, and the consciousness in, in, inhabits the different body. Um, th this makes no, this never made any sense to me. Like, what is it, what is it that's transferable, right? But the, between your right. mental structures, like that makes you, you, and my mental structures that makes me me, right? There's there's very likely, I mean, we talk about centers of the brain and areas of the brain where certain activity have certain responsibilities, certainly mm -hmm. true, but the neurological structures within those those groups are very likely not to map one-to-one -one in any human being. And it's so hard to experimentally investigate these things. Completely and, impossible. Yeah, that's this when you can to... function completely as everyone else, <laughs> and so it, it does make it so challenging that there there are these these little small features that you might detect. It's, I mean, it, it make reminds me again of the uh, the analogy with physics when there's these small little things that don't quite fit the model, but then it exposes this massive misunderstanding, yeah. right? Um, and so yeah, yeah that the brain is definitely another field it, where these things are amazing, yeah. I love it. It's it's really Voltaire used to talk about the beetle in the, the matchbox and he said that consciousness is like a beetle in the matchbox and that we we we, we all say that we have the, a beetle in our particular matchboxes and <laughs> but we can never show each other the beetle and we don't know that what we're calling a beetle is really the same as what this other person's calling a beetle and and what is the nature of that beetle and maybe you know what we're calling a beetle isn't really a beetle like it, it becomes right. very because you realize you you don't even have direct access of your own consciousness in a way that allows you to really say what it is right you don't have yeah. certainly don't have access to other people's conscious um and and so the, yeah the, the the living experience of individuals is likely to be wildly divergent but because it's inherently hidden um mm -hmm. from from each other we we assume it's more or less the same because largely we've learned to behave roughly analogously to each other mm -hmm. like we, we've we've learned to to you know everybody who speaks english for example has learned to speak english and therefore when we say i have a headache or i'm tired or whatever we 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 assume that we know what that means mm -hmm. but when you say you have a headache the experience of having a headache how could we possibly know whether that's analogous to what i think of when i would say i have a headache like we have a pain in our head is it a sharp pain a throbbing pain a, a spinny dizzy pain is it um, you know, and and then you know where is it located, and what what is the response to that, and how is it making you feel? Like those things are likely to be very different <laughs> across different people, um, yeah. and yet we just have this very simplistic thing. We say headache, and we sort of vaguely know enough about what that means to be able to use it as a word. But it, it's it's weird. And so yeah, I think these things are important to remember about people. Sorry, I'm I'm, I'm waxing lyrical about um, that's it's the, quite uh, the hard problem of consciousness. Right. I, uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that the one other area that we haven't touched that I suspect you've investigated is meditation, just mm. from your description, um, ah. and like Sam Harris, of course, and mm. exploration of consciousness and, and things like that. I'm just curious if you've... Are you a friend? Are you, are you a meditator? I've attempted. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah I, I am not consistent at all you know i <laughs> same as with many things in my life right i, I mediocre at everything including meditation so <laughs> that's that's fine yeah it, it takes it takes practice to practice right um i i, I don't know it, so yeah i have i spent uh, quite a period of my life meditating fairly regularly i have actually recently have fallen off that bandwagon quite badly but there was a period of my life where i was meditating quite regularly and i do try to meditate you know once every few weeks i, I will try mm -hmm. to remind myself to find some time to do it normally just the effort of just realizing i need to find some time to sit down for 10 minutes and do something or an hour and just do something for myself yeah. makes me makes me realize like how disorganized i'm i'm definitely prioritizing bad things right <laughs> um but in any case yeah I, I i i was talking recently on a on a episode of something i recorded for some other channel um where we were talking about the meditation practice and one of my favorite experiences was this sense of was this weird loss of self experience that sam has mm. talked about where you sort of 
I, my, my experience was that I was meditating in my bedroom and uh, I was I was just sort of settling the mind as it were um, trying to let the thoughts pass through me and I could hear a bird outside and it used to be when I was when I first started to learn to meditate these sorts of auditory distractions were very overwhelming to me um, but in this particular moment I I was calm and I could hear the bird and I was just letting it sort of pass through my mm. mind not holding on to it but but it was just there and, and then there was this beautiful moment where I couldn't tell whether I was the bird or not. <laughs> like I really right. lost any sense of being in where in my room versus being the bird. Mm. Like mm. I was kind of I was my, my myself had become wrapped up in the sounds that I was the immediate experience of whatever was happening in that moment. And partly that was the bird singing. Um, and and it's it's a very strange experience. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's entirely illusory. I don't know if it was. Yeah. meaningful but it was something interesting to feel uh, i enjoyed it, it would you describe it as similar to what's sometimes described as like a flow state when you're just like working and you're just lost in your work or was it distinctly different no it was very different i think flow mm -hmm. state's different because you're just you're just it's the flow state feels to me like if like a focus like to me it's like it, mm. it's you're, you're one with the task essentially but you're not losing the sense of yourself in that i guess but yeah it's it's it, it feels different i when, when i think about flow state i quite often think about one, one of my favorite hobbies used to be kayaking i used to do white water kayaking and one of the fun things about that is that um it's hard to think about anything else when you're responding to white water right and and you're constantly moving and reacting and responding and balancing and, and feeling the boat and listening and the water sound is horrendous and beautiful and wonderful um it's really hard to think about anything else and in that moment you have this sort of almost meditative perfect clarity of just being unable to think about anything else and just really responding to things in real time and everything is about the current moment and mm -hmm. um very little is about well i mean you, you sort of think about the the future maybe in the next two seconds but like that's about as far as you're gonna go about anything um and that's quite a great space to be um but yeah i don't think it's the same i think the loss of self yeah. is a really odd experience that i guess you just have to experience but again this is this is that same problem how can i know that this experience is the same as the experience that other meditative right. people are ex expressing it and interested yeah. in and maybe there's a deeper level that i haven't reached or something but i'm yeah, pretty I certain i have not experienced that loss of self and that's something that I, I would love to experience. And maybe, yeah. you know, coming back to religious experiences that mm. you get, I hear descriptions of these sort of, you know, spiritual awakenings and things mm. like that. And um, I don't think I've ever had anything like that. Um, no, I don't think I have either. And I, yeah. I, I do think there are probably places in my brain which were, so if, if, if I mean, I, you know, LSD, for example, is famously, you know, good at pressing the buttons that make you think you're mm -hmm. surrounded by beauty and meaning and connectedness and, and mm -hmm. you know, and, and all this sort of thing. And, and you can have these sort of quote unquote transcendental experiences, I think. Um, and I, so there are definitely if if it were the case that I could take LSD and have those experiences, then we definitely know for sure there are places in my brain where those buttons could be being pushed, right? And um, one wonders why those buttons might exist, evolutionarily speaking, um, mm. um, and what what might cause them to be pushed. Um, yeah, that that all all interesting fields of discovery. I don't have any answers for any of that, but yeah, I don't. And think... does it lead to a deeper truth? Is there truth there, right? And that's yeah. That's... Well, to me, that's that's the problem. Is I can't see how you could a priori learn a different, a, be a better truth. Like you or like you 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 can you can reflect on what you know like in the armchair, but I don't think you get new information. Or mm. okay. <laughs> Here's what I was thinking. Here's what I'm the first thinking. time I found you at a loss for words. This is great. No, it's, it's interesting because <laughs> it's interesting because I don't. I'm really tempted not to break it down, but also I, I it's too interesting not to. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. This is this okay. is something I said on another podcast as well because it was all kind of related, but doesn't doesn't hurt to repeat. Um, so there's a theory. There's a thing called the Mary's Room experiment. Are you familiar with Mary's Room? Um, it's about colorblind 
a researcher who, who studies color. You've, okay. you've heard this. Okay, so, 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 so it's, it's called Mary's Room. It's a thought experiment. And the idea is that Mary is in a room and she studies color. And everything in this room is black and white. Mm-hmm. Um, she's, every, you know, she's been artificially altered so that she, her skin is black and everything is just gray and shades of clay, gray. So she, she's basically in a room completely devoid of color. Mm-hmm. And yet uh, for her whole life, she's been you know, information has been pumped into this room, which tells her everything there is to know about color mm. scientifically from your know, wavelengths to how our eyes respond to the presence of light to, you know, what color means and, and the history of color and every, all, all these kinds of things. The question then is that if the, uh, Mary, after be, knowing all there is to learn about mm. color, leaves the room and sees color, you know, does she learn something new as in, is there knowledge in the experience of something? Mm-hmm. And so, I've never really understood why this feels like, I mean, I mean, maybe my misunderstanding, but I've never understood why this feels like a mystery. Because to me, the thing that Mary would learn seeing color is not actually about color itself, but actually about how her eyes act in response to color. She's learning something about mm. her eyes, actually, not about color. Now, when I, when I mentioned this recently, somebody pointed out that maybe when we say color, what we mean is what we see because people think of color as the kind of response our eyes give. So maybe that's what color is. But I think in the context of the thought experiment, given that the idea is that she's learned all there is to learn about color, specifically color, right? Right. That we must therefore assert that there was something about color that could be learned. You know, so what we're talking about here is the mechanics and mechanisms of color, right? Yeah, the experience. The, but not the experience specifically not, not the experience because in her room there's it's black and white all she's reading about is the mechanics of color mm-hmm. um but so she leaves the room right. and sees color for the first time as she learns something new about color and i would say no she's learned something about what her eyes do when exposed to light at certain wavelengths essentially is that but, not part of what color is yeah so i would like- say it's not it's part of her experience of her eyes <laughs> Like, as in, you, ca- she can't, nobody can experience color directly, right? Because color doesn't have a color, if you, if you think about it, right? A particular wavelength of light doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily have to correlate to any particular hue, right? It's mm-hmm. only in connection to our eyes and, and what our eyes do in response to those wavelengths that we see. And therefore, yeah. I can't imagine why there is anything that could be learned other than about her eyes and the way her eyes respond. And I think that this is this is fundamentally the the way I see a lot of this is that we are that we are a brain in a vat, and mm-hmm. we're getting information pumped in from the outside, and all we can do is react to the information that's being pumped in. Um, we what we can't do is say that we know what what is outside of those wires, right? We we right. only know that there are these this information coming in. We don't know really anything else, and mm-hmm. and therefore she doesn't know anything about color. She just knows about the information that comes in when. In theory, her eyes are being exposed to color. So, I, yeah, I find this weird and interesting. So, <laughs> when do we have, when do we have justification to believe we understand? Right, right. That well, external world. So, do you have an answer for that? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is open so, question. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, so, I, I genuinely enjoy the idea of thinking that human beings are great at sort of middle out exploration. Right. There is a problem, I think, that in a lot of people's views of philosophy, which is that um, you need to get to some bedrock truth. This is why mm-hmm. you know, Descartes wanted the cogito go sum. He wanted the bedrock of like, this is certainly true and I know it to be true and therefore I can build on that. Um, we, we can take that as assumption that we exist, right? We don't have to prove it. And we can also say that, okay, it seems like I exist and it seems like there are things in the world, right? And it seems that those things respond. respond. And it seems like my state changes, like I will get hungrier over time. And it seems like some things I can do will help prove that, help reduce that discomfort, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that falling off something tall that appears to be tall is bad and, and, and sitting on something soft feels comfortable, right? All of those things we experience through not base, we, we, don't, have to, we don't have to find a, a base philosophy for justifying sitting on a comfy chair as opposed to a hard chair being more enjoyable, right? right. We, we certainly have to have an experience of, of doing these things or all these materials. We don't even have to prove that the chair exists. We just have to say, 
I'm going to do what seems to me to be a thing that will make me comfortable based on what I previously remember having happened to me in the past <laughs> in response to something that seems like it's a chair and I will sit on it in this way and I'll have an expectation of this experience, but I'll update that experience, that expectation if my experience differs. Oh, it turns out this bean bag is full of broken glass. Who knew? Like That's new information. Right. <laughs> I've decided I don't like this. I don't have to prove externally there is a reality. You've updated your mental model. I've updated my current model, right? And this is why um, mental models is, uh, are so clever because they just don't give a shit about like right. foundational truths, right? That you just don't need that. Um, and, you know, babies do this. Ch children do this all day. You know, adults mm -hmm. do it. It's only philosophers that get... and and, and um, and theists and, and, and academics that get their knickers in a twist about needing base principles and foundational beliefs because because practically nobody else has ever had these things, right? Okay. Unless you can prove to me that somehow you've had access to bedrocked reality, to truth in some way, unless you can demonstrate to me that you've ever had that, then you're doing my model too. <laughs> Right. Because you, no human throughout the entire history of humanity has ever had access to bedrock reality, as far as I know. Right? Many have claimed, of course, but <laughs> I don't believe any of them. Um, so uh, you know, we're, we're we're great middle out explorers, and that's what we're doing. And I think that that's actually codified in what science becomes. Right? That science becomes the kind of codified version of that. It's like how, you know, mm -hmm. babies do it when they they're figuring their environments out and 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 complaining to the world about their discomforts. You know, but you know, every every human being does it when they're an adult, and science basically just codifies it and puts it into some formal practice. And I think that that's why science is so great because it works the same way humans work. Yeah, isn't that deeply unsatisfying? <laughs> I don't think so. I kind yeah. of find that more interesting though, because like, well, apart from anything else, because at least it's honest, right? I'm not pretending yes. to know what's at either yeah. end of the spectrum, right? That's one thing that it has going for it. But the second thing is like. I don't know. Like, I feel like if the answers were there, like if there was a bedrock truth, like that would be less interesting than the ability to not know what's out there and, and have it be mysterious and interesting. You know, like once you know how the magic trick's done, maybe the magic trick isn't so fun to watch anymore. You know, and like maybe, maybe I mean, I, I doubt very much that anybody, will, I mean, I don't even know if the question is intelligible in, you know, in, in a real sense. Mm -hmm. Here's an, here's an example of why I think this is beautiful. And I, I say this often as well, so apologies for repeating, but you know, for, for, in my perspective, right, and, and correct me if you think there's something I'm missing here, but the universe is either infinite, finite, or something else. That sounds fair. Right. Which one of those is not fucking crazy to you? Like, intuitively. <laughs> Just think about it for however long you like. Tell me which not one of those is not the in insane, how, like, mind-bending makes no fucking sense. Which one of those would you pick? <laughs> I don't know. Right, something they're, else, they're, I suppose. That's <laughs> how, how, that's the most meant. Like, how, if, if if something is something other than infinite or finite, I don't yeah. even. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the, that's almost the most great. Well, I don't know. I I kind of think they're all equally amazing. <laughs> that's right. Insane. They, they, they seem all and yet ridiculous. logically, yeah. I have no other move that it could possibly be. Right. So, yeah. so now tell me, science is boring, right? <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. Diamond, it's been absolutely delightful. I, I, I knew it would be. Um, certainly enjoyed the conversation. Is there anything you'd like? To, oh, the name of your channel is Diamond Discourse. Obviously, is there? there you, go. you know, any, yep. you got any any big talks coming up that you want to pimp or any? Oh, uh, so I'm. Uh, I guess this will be season three or something like that. Uh, <laughs> in seasons, wow, gracious! <laughs> only because of my video editing capabilities, right? It started started with a phone, literally just a phone, and uh, you know, then I upgraded with a mic and then i got a fellow uh se person to help me do some editing um but recently i've got a new computer that i'm hoping to be able to use some of the the technology and uh we'll see if, if i can get a little fancier but not too fancy so yeah it's hopefully some... we'll get some more videos out um especially with the weather getting better uh that's you know it's the season for getting outside um so. I'm very much looking forward to seeing it. Um, and and yeah, the, the, the good, uh, perfect is the enemy of the good, as they say. And, and that's right. Like a, a good video is worth having for sure. Um, I definitely feel like it's worth us. I, I, I've I've said this recently as, uh, a few times, I think, but but I keep saying that. I, keep, I think I'm I'm in the twilight zone of my own head. <laughs> um, uh, I I am. Um, <laughs> I I think it would be really good to get a lot of the sort of people, the sort of video creating type, you know community together and start swapping like 
tips and tricks and how tos mm-hmm. because like it is it isn't easy to uh, get started to bootstrap sure. a whole YouTube channel yeah. and and like navigate yeah. your way around it and then think about the editing and like there's so much amazing software out there that's completely free like you know mm-hmm. DaVinci Resolve for example by Blackmagic is is a mm. completely amazing and entirely free piece of video editing software nice. um, that it's certainly professional grade and there's like so many resources for free like you know clips mm-hmm. and music and sound effects and stuff and um, that you know, I think I think it would be beneficial for 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 to help people get an inroad into this because totally. actually I yeah. think for a lot of people there are probably a lot of people out there that are really potentially very good at SE but don't jump into making a channel because they're like yeah. how do I make the edit how do I get the camera looking right and right. how do I make the sound sound nice and yeah there's there's a more to it more goes into it than you might expect for sure and uh, and you know that's kind of been an enjoyable process to learn anyway and. Um, but and so there is that barrier there for sure of, of getting getting stuff out there yeah. um and, and how many conversations go unheard right that that would be really fascinating um so, yes exactly um, that and and uh, yeah i think lowering the but the lowering the cost of doing it is mm-hmm. is worth doing like one of the reasons so, so this this uh we, we record these conversations in Streamyard, right and yeah, there are definitely great. other tools that are better for this um, that I actually have access to and I can use, but this is just the easiest one by a far yeah. margin, fair margin, right? Everything else requires me to set up a bunch of stuff beforehand mm-hmm. and configure it, which is, yeah, it maybe is a little fancier, a little bit better quality perhaps. But the reality is like, it doesn't need it. Like we can just, we can just send a link and click and then just get into the conversation. And I think that that's great. Um, and, and I think, yeah, don't underestimate the power of your mobile phone as well. These days, you know, the yeah. mobile has got an amazing microphone and camera set up in it. Almost Absolutely. every phone nowadays can do some great stuff and yeah, just, you can just get crack a $20 on lapel upload. mic. You can do it. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly that. Diamond, thank you so much, mate. Yeah, I love the channel. Sure. Diamond Discourse, always good. Uh, always a pleasure to chat to you. Um, never enough time, as always. But um, yeah, until next time, I, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for, for having me on. All it's right. It's been a pleasure. Have a good one.